You know, not not that fit the criteria of what we were looking for. And uh, again, it, it's the disappearance <clears throat> without a witness, um, and the person, or there is evidence of other similar disappearances in that immediate area. Um, there's no disappearance that we cited that was in relationship or could be associated with a criminal event per se. Uh, also, none of the disappearances could deal with a possibility that water took the people away. Um, <clears throat> if I can diverge for a second, there's a story we talked about in the Rocky Mountain National Park. An individual named Alfred Bielarts had disappeared in 1930. And Alfred was a very small boy, two years old. And uh, he was camping with his mom and dad along a river in the middle of the National Park. And how they were starting to walk up the side of the river and Alfred got behind his parents just a little bit and he disappeared and the parents originally I'm sorry Alfred was four years old this was in 7 2 1938 Alfred uh, his parents thought he fell into the river but they weren't sure and they didn't think so because they would have heard something because this isn't a huge river and uh, the Park Service came out and immediately they focused on the water as is normal in search and rescue. Right. And, the, and they went to the point of getting permission to shut down the river. They dammed it, and they searched under every boulder going downstream for three and a half miles. They didn't find anything. So then they think, well, maybe we ought to start looking on the land. So a couple days later, they bring in some canines, and they track it uphill, which is weird because... If you know anything about search and rescue, small children and most people walk downhill when they're lost. Well, they went uphill, canines went uphill for about a 1,000 feet. They stopped at a fork in the trail, and the dog sat down and said, well, that's enough. We're not going any further, which is odd canine behavior. <clears throat> and the other thing you'll find in a lot of these cases is that dogs, whether they're dogs with the people that disappear or dogs that return after the people have disappeared, or the response from bloodhounds, canines, and search dogs, the dogs play a predominant role in many of these disappearances, and the behavior is very unusual. So these dogs sit down. Well, unbeknownst to everybody, about 2,500 feet further up the mountain, there's a, there's a husband and wife that are backpacking. And one morning they wake up, and they, saw, they thought they saw something or heard something about 750 feet above them on a rock ledge. 
they both look up and they see a little boy walk out to a rock ledge. And they're looking at it and they can't believe it. And they only see him for five, ten seconds. And then the boy turns around and walks back off the ledge and he's gone. And these people know exactly where this boy was at. And they said, there's no way this kid could have gotten to that location without assistance in some means. Well, they didn't know that Alfred had disappeared. They didn't know there was a huge search party until they got home, until Denver read the newspapers. They drive back to the park the following day, and they tell authorities what they saw. And they were showing a picture, and they said, yeah, that was, a, that was Alfred in their mind. Search parties go up there, and the location where Alfred was seen is a place called Devil's Nest. And I write in the book, and I say that locations in mountains, just like names of lakes, hilltops, ridges, they get these names for a reason. So uh, the searchers, 40 people, scour this mountainside uh, for three days, and they don't find anything of this boy or any remnants that he was there. Now, as I go further, and I'm not going to explain it all, but there are a series of events that happened at this park all in the same time frame that are beyond belief and beyond explanation that you'll never hear about anywhere else. And unless somebody went there like us and did something stupid, like spent days scouring the archives, you'd never hear about it. But it all seems too coincidental that all of these series of events and all of these missing people all occurred within this Rocky Mountain district in a, in a time frame that doesn't make any sense. So there's a, another cluster of missing. And as you look at the U.S., I mean, there's, there's people missing in Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona. And, and when you think, well, people disappearing in a desert, that seems pretty odd. Yeah, it does seem pretty odd. And when you read the stories, it even seems more odd. So don't think mountaintops or mountainsides or hillsides are exclusive. It's the same thing in deserts, too. So this area near Paris, Michigan, Paris and Baldwin, Michigan, I've written about it many times in my books, and for some reason there's a lot of very, very strange activity that goes on there. Uh, this family, her name was Amber Rose Smith. She disappeared uh, October 8th, 2013 at 1.30 in the afternoon. Twelve miles northwest of Paris is a city called Baldwin. Well, the family lived in Nuego County, and uh, I can tell you that this area has a lot of big, thick forests, and some of the stories go all the way back to the 1800s of disappearances. So this isn't a one-time-and-it's-over area that, for some reason, the area around the Great Lakes has a lot of disappearances. Well, Dale Smith was her dad, and he was in the front yard with uh, two family dogs and Amber, and they were kind of doing some work, and she was playing with the dogs. Well, he went in the house just briefly to use the restroom, and he came back in a couple min minutes, and Amber, at 30 months old, and her two dogs were gone. Now, for people, again, who have read my books, you'll know this scenario plays out time after time after time. A, a very, very small child disappears from a yard and a farm or a ranch or in a national forest and is gone quicker than you can believe. And then the parent gets back and starts yelling for the dogs, yelling for the child, and gets no response. Now, another part of this unusual aspect of disappearances that we found is that a lot of the children that we've documented have an unusual disability. And I can't explain it other than she did. She had severe mental and physical disabilities. Well, Dad searched for a while, and then she, he called for help. And this went on for almost a day and then the following day at about 140 some searchers were on a road almost two miles from her home and they found her standing in the middle of the road just staring down the road not moving and she had scratches on her body and her face and she was taken back to her parents didn't say much now, this is, this is the exact statement the sheriff made. He said, it's hard to imagine how a two-and-a-half-year-old child can survive that distance through the woods with temperatures that reach down into the 30s through the night. Then he went on to say, there's some that aren't convinced that she walked that entire distance. Maybe she was dropped off 
Those are things that we might have to con- determine in the future. Now, you and I and other parents out there know that a two, three-year-old kid, we know how fragile that is and really how far they can move through the woods alone. And for this sheriff, it's one of those rare times where a law enforcement person came out and said what's obvious to all of us. So first of all, for people that that know, the area specifically that I write about is very high up in elevation. There isn't, it's above timberline. There aren't a lot of trees. There's a lot of water and a lot of lakes. And there's a couple incidents, and there are many incidents that I write about where a child disappears while they're at a summer camp with a group of kids or in a group setting with a lot of kids. Uh, The case I write extensively about and uh, that is a case called Garrett Bardsley. And Garrett was a kid that uh, was with a Boy Scout group. And his dad went with the group. And they, uh, <clears throat> he was 12 years old, happened in August of 2004. They, w- they walked a short distance away from camp, and they went fishing in, the, in one of the lakes. Short time after Garrett was with his dad, he, he slightly fell in the water, and he got wet. And he told his dad he was going to walk back to camp and change. And his dad could watch him almost the entire distance until he hit uh, a tree line between themselves and the camp. He went into the tree line. His dad fished, waited another 10 minutes. Garrett didn't come back. He started to look for him, then uh, went back to the camp. Nobody saw him. A giant search ensues. And the only thing they found is they found one of his socks in a boulder field up above where he disappeared. Two things about that that are fascinating to me because of all the cases I've read. People disappear in boulder fields. I have no idea why. I have no idea what the assimilation may be. Second reason is is that footwear and socks tend to come off when these kids disappear. Again, I don't know why. It doesn't make any sense. But that sock was up above where he disappeared, and that doesn't make any sense because the path was obvious on where he was walking back to, there is no way he could have deterred and gotten lost. Well, you have a whole bunch of them from Mount Shasta, Mount Lassen, Lassen National Park. There was one that caught my eye, Greta Mary Gale. Uh, this girl is 30 months old at the time of her disappearance. She's playing with some other kids in the front yard and just vanishes. Two days later, uh, they find her. They finally found her on the side of a mountain. How far away? Do you remember how far away from where she had been taken? It, it, was a, it was quite a distance, but the more important fact behind it is that she was up on the side of this mountain laying next to a boulder. And if I've been to this place many times. If you looked at that mountain, you would think, why would anybody go up there? There's, there's nothing there. And unless she was hiding under this boulder, they would have seen her from the air, and they didn't see her. And the sad part about this is she was with her grandparents vacationing. And when she disappeared, her grandfather, who was a congressman at at the time, had a heart attack and died. Unusually, a large number of these kids will disappear while they're visiting the grandparents' residence. And the grandparents live in rural areas. And that's that's what happened with Keith. And it's, it's not clear from the clippings exactly what happened, other than he was there, he was in the yard, and he disappeared. And at about the time he went missing, the grandfather knew the area well, et cetera, et cetera. And according to Search and Rescue, it says, you know, 95% of the time, a one- to three-year-old is going to be found within two miles of a rural location, such as where Keith disappeared. Well, uh, an April 10, 1952 article in Lewiston Daily stated that the boy was found over a dozen miles away from the grandparents' home 19 hours after he disappeared, and he was found unconscious laying in a creek bed. Okay, so that's a little odd, because he had to go over two mountain ranges, fences, creeks, rivers, and this guy found 12, this little boy, who was two years old, barely could walk, and he was found 12 miles away. Now think about this for a second and say, okay, even under the best conditions, could you and I go 12 miles through the mountains in 19 hours? I don't know. And this little boy is found unconscious on the verge of death when he's found. 
Now, when we sat down and discussed this case, it's odd, yes, but what's even more odd to us is that the searcher was that far out looking for him. And we couldn't figure out why he was. And it doesn't make any sense unless somehow or another they had some suspicion that something really weird happened to be out that far 19 hours later. Because at 19 hours, you're, you're hugging pretty close to the point where the person was last seen, and you're not wandering too far away. You slowly, just the way search and rescue goes, you start close and you start fanning out. Why the searchers were 12 miles out at 19 hours is the million-dollar question. But again, it happened you know, almost 50 years ago, and it's, it's hard to get any real clear clear answers. But yeah, you're, you're right. This, this is one of those ones that's, that's a major whodunit how it happened. And the other point is, is that a lot of these kids are found in creek beds and river beds. And a lot of times they're dry creek beds and river beds. And when you start to try to think through this and say, well, why would they be there? Well, if there was water in it, maybe they're trying to get water. But also a creek bed and a river bed is an area that doesn't give up a lot of evidence of who was there. There's a lot of rocks and things, so it's hard to determine what kind of footprints and things you can get on rocks. So in 1868, in northern Michigan, near a city called Walhalla, uh, her dad, a guy named Henry Flynn, ran a lumber camp. And uh, his daughter was three years old, could just walk, and couldn't walk too well. But she would, up this hill... The dad would uh, get get trees and do the milling, etc. And then the horses would drag the cart with the lumber down to the bottom of the hill, and Katie would get off, and then she'd run back to the top of the hill for another ride down. And I don't know how many times a day she did this, but she did it a lot. And at one point, uh, the dad went back to the top of the hill, and Katie wasn't there. And this he started to get frustrated and he started looking around and in a very, very odd coincidence, as they're running around looking for Katie, two hunters show up and everyone's screaming, looking for Katie, blah, blah, blah. And these hunters start helping Mr. Flynn look for his daughter. So as they're searching, they hear this kind of, it was described in the article as a feeble cry inside dense, dense brush miles from where they were. And as they walk up on this little cry, they see what they think is a giant bear jump from the location where Katie was at into the river and absolutely fly through the river and disappear. So when Mr. Flynn gets his daughter, he says, when we were calling you, why didn't you come back to us? And she said, it wouldn't let me. And Mr. Flynn says, what do you mean it wouldn't let you? Uh, Mr. Wolf wouldn't let me. And he goes, what do you mean Mr. Wolf wouldn't let you? He says, what happened to your hat? And and she says, the wolf ate it. And he goes, what do you mean the wolf ate it? He took it off my head, and he ate it in front of me. He says, well, did you get anything to eat? And and she says, yeah, the wolf got some berries for me and put it in its paw and handed it to me. And Mr. Flynn's a pretty smart guy, just like you and I are, are really brilliant. Well, gee, a wolf couldn't hold berries in its hand. So, but she was pretty adamant that it was a wolf. And this goes on, and there's a, there's a couple different stories over the years that don't wander too far from what was told. His son was uh, in a wilderness area, and he was with... Uh, a group of adults and somehow he got away from them and in fact this is one of the videos we did that you can watch online on our website and uh, he disappeared they searched for him and four years later they found his shoes and a sweatshirt and a pair of pants inside out 550 feet above the trail that he was on he was three years old and we made the hike up to the location where they found his remains, and they only found a tooth on the top of his cranium. And I can tell you that was one of the hardest hikes I've ever made in my life. We were on all fours going up this steep, steep embankment. And Alan had explained to me beforehand 
that his son never liked to tie his shoes. And he couldn't understand how his shoes ended up 550 feet up this embankment. And originally, the sheriff in the county said, well, he must have been taken by a bear or a mountain lion. Well, Alan showed the clothing to some mountain lion experts, and three of them said, no, he wasn't taken by a mountain lion. It's just on such little damage done to the sweatshirt he was wearing. It doesn't make sense. And then everyone questioned why his pants would be inside out. And there, therein lies another issue on many of these missing persons cases is that when they're found, their pants are inside out. Think about that. Yeah, it, it, uh, Jared's shoes looked to be in immaculate condition for supposedly being in the winter for four years. The colors were vibrant. Really? Yeah, it, well, and like you watch this video and you can see the shoes. It's going to be puzzling to everybody that they were out for four years. But how he got up that 550-foot area is beyond any logical grasp of, a, of an explanation. I, I have no idea, because I did all I could, and I'm in phenomenal shape to get up the side of that mountain. Very, very interesting case there, a kid named Dennis Johnson. The Johnson family was on vacation. They pulled into an outlet to picnic. The dad told Dennis and his sister why don't you go out and look for squirrels and, and some uh, acorns and come on back when you're done, but we'll get everything set up and you guys just go have fun. So Dennis and his sister take off and after a short, short distance, they, uh, they separate. And the daughter, which, which is kind of, this happened in 66, the daughter is the first one that disappears. And Dennis starts looking for her and comes back to his dad, he was only eight years old, and the daughter was, I think, nine or ten. Dennis comes back to his dad and says, hey, I can't find my sister. Let's, let's start looking. So Dennis and his dad start looking, and Dennis disappears, unbeknownst to his dad. His dad, they split up. His dad comes back to the picnic area, and a ranger drives back in a car and says, are you missing a daughter? He says, yeah. Well, at a campsite at two miles away, a girl walked up. And we have her. And he goes, well, that's great, but now my son's missing. So, again, that happened in July of 66. He was, Dennis was eight years old. And they searched for Dennis for weeks, and they never found him. What's unusual about that event is that about three miles from the site where Dennis disappeared, we did get the FOIA on this. And in the reports, it said that they found some kind of shelter area where something large was sleeping under. And they didn't call it a den, they called it a shelter area. That's the second time I've heard that air, that wording used on the disappearance of a young boy. That happened also in Crater Lake where they found a shelter area up above where another boy disappeared with his dad. Now Dennis Johnson has and uh, Dennis Martin who disappeared from Great Smoky Mountains I don't, I don't put a lot into disappearances and things and familiarities, but I got I to gotta say that I wrote about this and it, it bothered me. So Dennis Johnson and Dennis Martin were both, Dennis Johnson was eight, Dennis Martin was six. And Dennis Johnson's dad's name was William, and Dennis Martin's dad's name was William. And they both disappeared in a national park wearing a red shirt and they do both disappeared within years of each other. And I wrote about that in the book because, again, it's not that frequent that kids disappear and are never found. But both these Dennises disappeared and they were never found. And the report specifically indicated that William Johnson and William Martin waited at that park long after the search was over, searching for their boys. And they waited for weeks afterwards looking for more help and looking for answers and never got it. If these two men could have met each other, I'm sure they were duplicates of each other with the way they looked for their boys. And uh, I, I should say that um, I had the opportunity to interview uh, Mr. Martin, uh, Dennis Martin, who disappeared in the Great Smokies. He won't talk to the press. And I didn't call beforehand, but I walked up to his house and he lives in Knoxville. This happened in the 60s, and I knocked on the door with another researcher, and he and I uh, he came out to the front porch. I told him who I was and what I was 
what I was there for. And he says, you know, I haven't talked about this event in years. Right away, he got tears in his eyes. He says, I haven't talked about this in years, and it, my, my wife and I have lived with this for a lifetime, and it's, it's almost ruined us as people, and I, I just don't want to dwell on it anymore. And I told him, I said, hey, I came all the way from California to talk to you, and if I could just, just get a couple of answers to a couple of questions, I'd be eternally grateful. The, the bodies on the young found deceased and the young found alive are pretty consistent in that there's scratches over their entire body. Uh, many times they're missing clothing, sometimes a lot of clothing. Sometimes they're found naked. Uh, other times, if they're found alive, um, and this is this is something that's unusual because I doubt it's noted in many archived articles by the reporters, but in, say, a dozen or so, they say that the child was in excellent health, but they had a minor temperature. And that's something that initially, when I when I read about these, I thought, well, okay, that's that's a one-time random occurrence, and I can guarantee that the search and rescue teams that are working these cases never think to even go outside these parameters to the degree that sometimes they have to. And some of the young, young, it's usually boys, under the age of five, disappear. And uh, there was a case out of uh, Mono, California, in your Kern County region, just outside of Yosemite National Park on the eastern side. A uh, small boy disappears, and him and his family are vacationing with their camper at a region right near a lake. And the kid, they're looking for him for a couple of days, and they bring in some fresh dogs. And this is one of those strange types times where the dogs start going uphill. And I'm not talking a little hill. This is a huge hill. And what I write in the book is that as, because I went to this area, and as you walk up this hill, and I'm talking, I walk 100 feet up, but I'm huffing and puffing, and I turn behind me, and I have a full view of the campsite where this kid disappeared, and the lake, because there's nothing on this hillside. It's, it's super steep. So he hikes up at 3,000 feet, but the kid's not done. He goes over the top of that mountain, down into a valley, and he starts hiking the next mountain. And now he's going up four or 5,000 feet. And the way this was found is a dog actually bit on, the, bit on the trail and started going up the hill. Middle of the night, they stopped, and I'm sure that the searchers thought this is insanity. And that's why they called it the night, and they went back. The next day, they bring in Army personnel to help them search. And an Army sergeant is two mountains, and we're not talking hills, we're talking mountains away near a peak on the outskirts of Yosemite. And he goes around a boulder, and he found this finds this boy dead laying on the ground. And when the reporter interviewed the soldier, he asked him, he says, were there, were there any visible injuries? And the soldier commented that, oh, I couldn't make a determination on that. Now, you and I know that if we walk up on a body and we don't see anything, we're going to be able to say, hey, there were no visible injuries that I saw. Yet if he were told to just keep his mouth shut and not talk about it, they just probably going to say, well, you know, I really don't know, and I really can't comment about that, which was kind of the statement that the sergeant made. And it was, again, it's one of those cases 5,000 times outside search parameters. The kid was naked. He didn't have any shoes on. Again, no comment about the feet. It was, it's a totally bizarre story. That is a very strange part of this story, and I talk about it in both books. At the beginning you start to think, well, maybe these kids with disabilities, um, because of that disability, disappeared. Because of their inability to think logically like you and I, they disappeared. But when you get into the minutia of the data, there's too many for it to be a random chance like that. And it's too coincidental that they disappear under the circumstances that they do. Uh, there's one case where uh, a small boy, again, disappears. Searchers look for him for days. He's not found. And when he's eventually found, again, found so far outside the search parameters as it's ridiculous, again, found without any clothing. The mom and dad come over. They view the body. And uh, the searchers say, well, you know, he probably had hypothermia, and he took his uh, clothes off. This is one of those cases where the parents said, hey, Nick's on that. My kid couldn't take his clothes off. 
he couldn't dress himself. Hmm. So, under that scenario, there wasn't one mention in the search and rescue report or in any law enforcement document about how they can reconcile that. We were talking about the boys and uh, how they disappeared under strange circumstances. There's a case out of the Northern Cascades where a mom and a son were picking berries in the middle of the woods. And, they, and these people were in the middle of the woods. And the uh, as they're picking the berries, the mom's maybe 50, 75 feet, doesn't, not in line of sight of their son, but they hear a scream. The woman starts to run towards the direction of the scream, and the scream gets further away, and it's a, it's a more muffled scream the second time. She runs faster, and a barely a third scream, but the kid's never found. Now, this is a Native American woman, so they bring in a tribe of Native American searchers and they never find the boy. And for people that don't, this this occurred decades and decades ago. For people that don't understand, if it was my son that's missing, I want Native American trackers on it because they these guys were some of the best in the middle of the uh, 20th century. Yeah, absolutely. They, they look for subtleties that most searchers don't look for: animal signs, tracks, etc. Well, they didn't find any animal tracks. They didn't find anything, and they never found the boy. Now, what's interesting is you fast forward 30 years, there's a boy that was uh, in a camper near Wenatchee Lake, again, in this same area, probably no more than 20 miles away from where Pankinen, the boy, the berry picker, disappeared. This boy was uh, in the back of a camper with their cat and her, his younger sister. This boy, again, was uh, was sleeping, and the parents were just walking through the woods, and kind of enjoying the site. And originally they were there to hunt. So uh, they kept the camper in view at all times. They wanted to make sure that they didn't get too far away. And uh, this was uh, October 1973. His name was Jimmy Duffy. He was two years old. And they walked behind a set of trees just momentarily, and they hear a scream. And they run from behind the trees, and they see the camper door open. They run as fast as they can, and they get up to the back of the door, and they look inside. The daughter is still asleep, and the cat is still asleep. And Jimmy is gone. So, again, I write to the sheriff's office. I explain what we're doing, and I ask for copies of the report. They never had any copies. They said, wow, we don't even know anything about this case. He must have been found. I said, well, the best we can tell, he's never been found. So they go back into their archives, and they search and search, and two months later, they come up with the case, and they say, you're right, he's never been found. Thanks for doing this. And they mail me copies of the report. Well, the sheriff's office, right from the onset, started to accuse the parents of killing the boy and disposing of him. And they they've, they laid on this for two or three weeks in the reports. And, God, I felt bad for the parents because eventually oh, they... Yeah. They sent them to Seattle police. They, the parents took polygraphs, and they were completely exonerated. And what's unnerving about it is not only they lost a lot of time on the case, but law enforcement, there's no way that they understand that this has been going on right in that Wenatchee, Northern Cascades area for 60, 70 years under the exact scenario I just gave you. Uh, there's a boy named Bobby Pankinen who disappeared in a, in a cluster with other boys about the anywhere between the ages of four and nine years old, all within a 80 to 90 mile radius of one location in really, really rugged wilderness area. And in most of the instances, they're doing mundane things. They're berry picking. They're doing strange. They're, they're not doing strange things. They're just hanging out. Well, this one kid named Wesley Piatote, berry picking with his mom. These are Native Americans. They're in the rugged wild. His mom hears a muffled scream and starts running towards him. She hears a second scream louder, and she starts really running. And now everyone's running. He disappeared. The kid was never found. Now, the way I explain this in the book is a scream is one of the last gestures you're ever willing to make or ever can make before you view it as the end. You don't have enough time to explain, hey, help me, I'm I'm falling. A scream is something abrupt and major 
and it's the last thing that they'll usually hear. And there's a couple of these stories in both books where parents hear a scream of the kid, and they disappear, and they're never found. Now, in the same radius, in the same area, and it's, in a, it's near Wenatchee, Washington, that a lot of these things occurred, uh, a little boy named Jimmy Duffy was in a camper with his sister while his parents walked around the outside of this camper, and they went there for the weekend. Parents are about 200 yards from the camper, and they have it in view. Short period of time, they walk behind a couple trees. They both hear a scream. They run around the outside of the trees. The back of the camper's open. They don't see anything. They run as fast as they can into the camper, and they look inside. The daughter is still asleep, and their cat is still inside, and Jimmy is gone. A massive search of this area, the boy is never found. Now, this is a really interesting case because the sheriff uh, lost the case file, and he, he put it under his wing, and he worked for weeks, him and another clerk, and they found the case file, and they, they sent it all to me. And it's now open again, but it wasn't. And the interesting part about this case is that the detectives working it initially accused the parents. And, I mean, they drilled these parents hard. And... Uh, Eventually, they got Seattle PD to do polygraph exams on both of them and cleared them both. Now, imagine this, George. You lose your son in the middle of nowhere. You spend the next two or three weeks defending yourself as detectives are honing in on you. In the meantime, nobody's looking for your son, and your son is never found. By the time you're exonerated, the trail's closed. That's it. And what I'm telling you about these boys missing up, in, up north, I guarantee you nobody's put this together. Uh, as you can expect, I've received hundreds and hundreds of emails from people that have their own twist on what might have happened here. And some of them were very well written, quite thought through, and came from intellectual types. And <clears throat> one, one specifically was about the ages of many of these kids between the age of, say, six and nine. And they stated that they're at this is the observation the person made, is that these children are at the age where they can take care of themselves, essentially, but they're at that optimum age of learning. And they, they thought it was unusual that this was the age when the kids disappeared and were taken. Some of the kids said some, some pretty strange things. There were a couple of cases where they said that they were taken by a bear and the bear cuddled with them all night, and the bear left, and they left. And this happened more than once. And, uh, I mean, there's I've talked to bear experts all over America, and they said, that's, a, that's not going to happen. Come on. You know, if a bear, a bear rarely is even going to approach you. A bear may, may approach a child, and if it approaches the child, and if it's really, really, really hungry, maybe there's going to be an attack, but it's not going to cuddle with something all night. So I, I've written a couple books about Bigfoot, and in some circles, some people would think maybe I have more knowledge than others on in, in, in a certain realm of Bigfoot. But I'm also one of these kind of guys that has a pretty wide breadth of, of things. Now, I do a lot of reading um, I look into a lot of unusual events, and just just like you know a lot about the UFO world and Area 51, George, and I've read a lot of books about abductions and John Mack and the abductee phenomena, and I and you start to think, well, these young kids are disappearing, and I ask some DNA experts, when's our DNA at the optimum? And it's that under 10 region where our DNA really doesn't, doesn't change much, and it's at that purest state. Well, then you start to look at an area like Pennsylvania, and we didn't get into this, but we can talk about it another time, where the majority of the disappearances were young kids across an entire state in the 40s and 50s, and then it stopped. Well, that doesn't make any sense. You know, it, it, during a certain span of time, this age group disappears. And I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but asking about DNA in this age group, some of these, in fact, a majority of these kids eventually made it back. They could, most of them couldn't say what happened. But, again, they have these scratches all over them. If there was some work being done on them, we'd never know because sometimes they're so scratched up, nobody knows. Sometimes they're found in the middle of a trail. 
where searchers are going. It's almost as though some intelligent entity puts them in a location knowing that searchers are going to find them. It's like you're gone for a while. Okay, now we don't need you, but now we're going to put you in a place where we know that you're going to get found. And they put you there, and the searchers find them. And then they're baffled. They say, we search this area 30 times. We go up and down this trail every day. And then they're found, and there's no marks on them per se, except every once in a while, especially on, in the East Coast edition, the kids are found, and they're, they're scratched badly. And I addressed that a little bit. It happened in, in Arizona a lot with a, a cluster of young boys that also disappeared. And in the newspapers, they say they were horribly scratched to the point of almost being gored. And in the newspaper articles, it says, well, it's obvious that they were walking through the bush with no care for themselves. And I said, and I explained this in the book, and I say, you know, a three- or four-year-old or a five- or six-year-old, they're not going to randomly walk through needles and thorns and berry bushes and just horribly scratch themselves up. If it gets that bad, I think they're going to sit down and just wait. But I don't think that the, a small boy or a small girl is going to just randomly walk through this stuff and just tear their body up. That's not the mentality.